we have another service going on across the hall called The Gathering. They're with us this morning and every morning on Sunday. It's a more contemporary service, and I'm giving them a moment to catch up on the video. I have no affirmation whether they see it right now or not. Hi. <laughs> I'd like to also welcome those who are watching on Facebook Live. This is what this thing is right here. People are watching and streaming the service right now around the world. Hi. <laughs> and I'd like to also and welcome those who are listening on the radio. I'd like to welcome to all of you. Before we begin this morning, just want you to make sure you understand what my job is before you throw stuff at me this morning. It's to preach the Bible. <laughs> And before we do that, we need to take kind of a, a deep breath. Everyone in here, no deep, deep breaths, okay? Because I'm going to talk about politics of sorts. Don't run out of here. And the reason why, I, trust me, if you know me, I would not intentionally bring this up the subject, but First Peter is talking about our relationship to the government. And then we have to talk about rulers and those under its authority. And it's a very touchy subject. And if you have any complaints or comments, at the end of the day, you can send them all to Jim Neal. <laughs> My associate pastor loves the feedback. I know many of you don't know me too well, but I'm not a very political guy. Not that politics is not important. It is. Um, I'll privately give you my input on politics, but I am lacking in the passion that many of you have. And I want to kind of explain a little bit of this. And a little history here. I'm not giving any endorsements. A little history here. I remember the first time I had the chance to vote for president. It was in 1992. First time. Maybe some of you was like your 10th time. And I had the chance to vote for president. And before then... Get this, I had been a Christian for about one year uh, the summer before when I was 19, and now I was 20, the summer of 1992. And during that summer, leading up to the election, I was an interim youth pastor at a very large United Methodist Church in Little Rock. Now, if you know anything about where I was in Little Rock, that church was the hub of Bill Clinton's territory, and the pastor had a history with the Clintons, and back then, he thought it was funny to put on a bumper sticker on his car that said, put Hillary in office. This is 1992. One night, Clinton's daughter, Chelsea, came to the youth group where I was the youth pastor. Didn't know anything about politics. I'd just welcome her like anybody else. And I, I don't remember much about that night, but I was playing Frisbee with her, and I accidentally busted her lip. Just saying. That's my claim to fame. <laughs> I'm just telling you. And ne needless to say, the summer crowd I was around were, were full-blown Clinton supporters. And I was still trying to figure things out because I didn't know anything about politics. I just became a Christian a year ago. And if you remember that, that year, there was a third-party guy running named Ro Ross Perot. And in the summer... He came to Little Rock to speak at a convention. And so I thought, I know nothing about politics. I'm going to go. So I show up at a, at a Ross Perot rally, and I could not believe it. I felt like I was at church, singing songs, hollering, saying amens. I thought, what is going on in here? Summer was over. It's been around mostly Clinton supporters, then the Ross Perot thing. So I come back to my campus in Russellville, Arkansas Tech University, where I mainly hung out with Southern Baptists. And the Southern Baptists were full-blown George Bush senior supporters, big time. This is all new to me. So on election night, I was uh, actually a DJ at the campus station. And I remember the crew that was coming in after me, they were setting all up for the election returns, and we waited and waited. And as you know, Bill Clinton, he's the one that came out on top to win the presidency. But this is what, this is what I remember the most. In response... Some people were elated beyond elated, and other people were crushed beyond crushed. And I remember that that really bothered me. 
Some people acted like utopia was about to be ushered in, and other people act like it was the end of the world, and it just bothered me. And ever since that election, politics has left a bad taste in my mouth. And I'm not saying it's not important, because it is important. I'm not saying you shouldn't be involved, because you should be involved. But here's the deal. I have learned throughout the years, in my short span of time being a Christian, that Christians put way too much hope in politics. If you are overly elated or overly dejected after an election, then maybe you have forgotten the gospel of our sovereign reigning king. Let me share this with you. Douglas Wilson, he has this quote. I think it's very important. I'm going to put it up for you. He says, in our hearts, in our hearts, we should not be Republicans, Democrats, or some third party, but monarchists. We give our ultimate allegiance to the only true king. Does it can't mean you can't be something on the outside, but on our hearts, we should not be Republicans or Democrats or some third party, but monarchists. We give our ultimate allegiance to the only true king. And for this morning, this is what I want. Here's a term I want to stick with you. Let's call ourselves absolute monarchist. That's our affiliation. We are absolute monarchists. When the world is overly rejoicing or overly dejected, as absolute monarchists, we should place our only hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. So this morning... Through God's word, I'm hoping to give you a proper political perspective. Not saying it's not important. Not saying you shouldn't be involved. Not saying you shouldn't let your faith integrate into your politics. But this morning from the word, we're going to get a proper political perspective. So no matter what country you live in, no matter what country you're from, no matter what political system they have in place, this proper biblical perspective will give you an understanding of what it means to live under our sovereign king. So let's get organized this morning in a, in a hierarchy structure. I'm going to put this, put this up for you. We're going to, here's how we're going to go. We're going to look at, number one, how God relates to the king and the people. Number two, how the king relates to God and the people. Number three, how the people relate to God and the king. And there's going to be a lot of overlap in these categories but you're going to get the general gist. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine our text from 1 Peter chapter 2, which was just read, and I'm going to branch out and look at the wisdom from the book of Proverbs to get a proper perspective. So we're going to take Proverbs, and we're going to mix in Peter together, and that's where we're going to go. So let's start with the first one, how God relates to the king and the people. God is the sovereign king of all kings and all earthly rulers and people are under his reign. Here's the first proverb. I'm going to put it on the screen for you. Proverbs 25, 2 through 3. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings to search out a matter. As the heavens were height and the earth were depth, so the heart of kings is unsearchable. God knows all the details of life, but all is not revealed, for it says there is the glory of God to conceal a matter. Now, now, follow along with me on these levels of authority. Number one, God is the ultimate authority and sovereign who rules with infinite wisdom and authority and might. Next level, under God, we have the rulers who have a certain form of glory as they search things out. Rulers are not absolutely sovereign but they are hopefully trying to rule with appropriate authority and make wise decisions. God, rulers, and then the people. The people of the land don't have a sneak peek into the motives of the king, but the hearts of the king are unsearchable. But only God knows the hearts of earthly rulers. Only God knows the hearts of his people. So God is the one with absolute wisdom, absolute power, absolute authority. Okay, we're going to start there. Now let's consider God's authority over earthly rulers. Look at Proverbs 21.1. I'll put it up for you. 
The king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. And I get this. The imagery is water flowing through a ditch, which a farmer can direct whatever, wherever it is needed to water dry fields. And this is saying that the Lord, he directs the king's heart according to his sovereign will. One scholar said that it's the modern equivalent that rulers are putty in the hand of God. Rulers are putty in the hand of God. And in this context, it's probably positive because it's speaking about Israelites, kings, how, how God can shape the Israelite king as putty to accomplish his sovereign will, to be an instrument of blessing to the people. But get this. God is still sovereign when rulers are wicked. He's not responsible for their evil acts because you can think about God being sovereign over evil Pharaoh, right? But nonetheless, he is still sovereign in control. And the leaders, like Pharaoh or anybody else, should humble themselves and not be proud under his sovereignty. But get this. This is the part that's really going to kind of blow your mind. Is that God places people in leadership. And we're going to see that here in a moment. Just let that sink in. God places people in leadership. And we're going we're to get there in just a second, okay? But first, look at our First Peter context. First Peter, here we are, First Peter. We're in our, our, our text this morning. Chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Here we go. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him, for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For starters, believers are called to submit to governing authorities. It's their role to punish evil and reward the obedient. Your role is to submit. But what if you didn't vote for the person in authority? Too bad. You still have to submit because God placed them in authority, and if you resist them, listen to me, if you resist them, then you resist God. And where is that in the Bible? I'm uh, glad you asked. Romans chapter 13. You can study this later. I'm going to put it up for you. Romans 13. Great passage. But for this morning, I want you to consider verses 1 and 2. Make sure you see this. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. I'm going to read that again. And those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. God appoints who is an authority? Who was an authority when this scripture right here was written? Let me remind you. Paul wrote this passage while Christians were under the ruthless ruler Nero who persecuted Christians. And Paul is basically saying God put him in power and you Christians must submit to him. Ooh, that's tough. So are we saying that God is morally responsible for the evil that Nero committed? No, no, the text never says that. Nero is responsible for his wickedness. But God, in his sovereign will, placed him in office. And you go, well, why would God do that? Why does he put evil people like Nero in office? Why? I mean, why does he put good people in office? Why does he do that? Well, sometimes God puts a certain person in leadership to bless a nation. And other times, we don't, might not like to believe this or understand this, sometimes God puts a ruler over a nation for its judgment. For its judgment. Not to bless them, 
but to bring trials and judgment upon that nation. Perhaps that's what God was doing with Nero. But all we know that God is our sovereign king who appoints all rulers. And get this, here's the perspective. Rulers come and go. That's why our hope cannot be in one president, one political party, or one particular movement. Because, perspective, we are absolute monarchists. You can be involved politically. You can support one president, one party. That's fine. But in your heart, absolute monarchists. Because God is the ultimate ruler, Lord, and King. Okay, let's back up now. Move on to the second part. How the King relates to God and the people. There's a lot to say about kings and queens and presidents and prime ministers and whatever other titles for rulers of nations. But let me give you a summary. Here's a summary, all right? Kings are to rule with wisdom and justice under the sovereignty of God where the people are protected and wickedness is punished. I'm going to say that again. Kings are to rule with wisdom and justice under the sovereignty of God where the people are protected and wickedness is punished. Back to our text in 1 Peter. Look again at the very end of verse 14. It says that God has set up the king for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. The government, when it's working rightly, is to punish evildoers and commend the obedient. And like we saw in Romans 13, that the pagan ruler, the pagan ruler, is even seen as God's servant to punish evil and to praise those who do right. Proverbs 20, 26 says, A wise king winnows the wicked and drives the threshing floor over them. Whew, that's a brutal text. As wheels go over the grain to get the seed out, so the king rolls on the wicked for separation and punishment. Once again, the whole point of the whole sermon today is perspective. Does that remind you of anybody else who does that? King Jesus. At the final end, when it's all said and done, there will be a final separation, as it says in Matthew 3.12. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear the threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And so you see an earthly ruler doing some of that. But Jesus is our ultimate king who will do the whole world. Now, not only are the rulers expected to bring justice, but it is throughout the Bible that rulers are to have a special concern for the poor. I'll put Proverbs 29, 14 up for you. It says, if a king judges the poor with truth, his throne will be established forever. King Lemuel in the book of Proverbs was told by his mom in Proverbs 31, 8 through 9. She said, open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all the unfortunate. Open your mouth, judge righteously, and defend the rights of the afflicted and needy. You'll see it time and time again in the Bible that justice was to extend and, and go down to, to those who have no power to defend themselves, such as the orphan, the widow, or the sojourner. And, and the king was to stick up and bring justice their way. And in no, in no way, shape, or form am I uh, advocating for any certain special government program or anything like that. But I want to tell you this. The Bible is certainly against virtue signaling. Virtue signaling is politicians who say something about caring for the needy and absolutely do nothing about it. The Bible's against that virtue signaling to act like there is a care in my heart for the poor when there is not. And you'll see time and time again in the Bible, priority of caring for those with the least amount of power to fend for themselves. Once again, perspective. When our king was on this earth, King Jesus, considered what he did. He spent a significant amount of time caring for the poor. And if you want to take it even further, he died for poor, wretched sinners like you and like me. That is the King Jesus we follow. And lastly, as to where the rubber meets the road, it's the part where we actually do stuff, is how the people relate to God and the King. 
How do the people relate to God and the King? Verse 15, look at it. For such is the will of God that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. I want to read that again. For such is the will of God that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. You know, during this time, there was accusations about Christians being disloyal to the emperor or trying to overthrow the emperor. And Peter tells them to submit to the authorities, and if you submit to the authorities, that will shut their mouth. It will, it will cut off the ignorant talk of foolish men. Those who say that Christians were trying to overthrow the government, those people would be muzzled. And they wouldn't say such things. Because Peter, in our text here, and Paul, they never call for the overthrow of the government, but, in this context, submission to it. Now, of course, there are, there are really big extremes that you can think of, and we can talk about those another time, where you talk about the overthrow of the Nazis, or you got it all the way onto this other extreme, where you just go hole up somewhere and don't pay attention to what's going on in life. But in this context, right here, we're seeing that Peter is calling for a submission to the government. We'll talk about disobedience to the government in just a little bit. But right now, look at verse 16. Act as free men, and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. So we're free in Christ, but we don't use our freedom to indulge in evil. It says that we act as bond slaves to God and bring Him all the glory. And what does it say? We honor all people, even those we disagree with politically. We love those in Christ. We fear God and honor the King even when the ruler is a godless idolater. And that's what was going on here. Godless idolater. And Peter says, honor, honor. So let's break down the submission to governing authorities in the specific details. Are right, you ready to do this? We're going to get really specific now. Okay? If you're going to submit to the governing authorities, the first thing you need to do is pay your taxes. Can I hear an amen? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> Romans 13. Romans 13, 6 and 7. Because of this also, pay taxes. For rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. One of the ways you submit to governing authorities is you pay taxes. What if the taxes that you pay accomplish godless things? Well, the Christians back then were to pay taxes and some of their taxes went into creating pagan temples. They were to pay taxes, and some of the taxes went into paying the salaries of government officials that persecuted them. And in this context, Paul's saying, pay your taxes. And in our context, where it's appropriate, you can work to change laws and go against godless activities. But we are called to submit to the leadership. One of the ways we submit is by paying taxes. Another way that we submit, number two, is obey the law of the land. Obey the law of the land. Now, we've already seen this in Peter. We've already seen this in Paul. But I want to ask the question, is there ever a context where you would disobey the laws of the land and instead of obeying the godless laws of the land, you decide to follow the law of God? Is there ever an occurrence in the Bible for that? And there is. You can think of Peter and John preaching the gospel. They get busted. The governing authorities say, no more preaching the gospel. Peter and John say, too bad. We're going to keep preaching the gospel. And they kept preaching the gospel. Old Testament, Daniel, his three friends, 
did not submit to the governing authorities, and they took the consequences which God rescued them from. There are times when you must obey God and not man. But through it all, according to what we've been studying this morning, through it all, even if you disobey, disagree with the laws of the land, you are still to show honor and respect to those in authority. But Russell Moore says, honor does not mean blanket endorsement. Just because you honor and show respect to governing officials does not mean blanket endorsement. For us, we vote on biblical convictions and we promote truth in all spheres of life, including the political. But through it all, we are called to honor and respect those in authority. We are to respect those that we didn't vote for. And we are to honor those who sometimes make laws that drive us crazy. Honor, respect. And the third thing, showing submission to the government, is prayer. Pray for those in authority. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil, and quiet life, and all godliness and dignity. Over the years, have you criticized government officials more than prayed for him? If you didn't feel convicted right there, I must say that again. <laughs> Over the years, have you criticized elected officials more than you have prayed for them? The Word of God says you need to pray for them. Even those you disagree with, you need to pray for them. You need to intercede for them. And the idea comes from Jesus when he says, and as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. What would you want from other people if you were in leadership? You would want their prayers. And lastly, the way we show submission, we live a righteous life. Live a righteous life. No matter the results of the election, we can still impact culture through the gospel of Jesus. Proverbs 14.34 says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. When people walk in righteousness and justice, it can benefit the whole nation. Do not think that if your candidate wins, then politicians can just take over and they can do all the wonderful things that maybe you should be doing. And on the other hand, if your candidate loses, do not think that all hope is lost because you lost. And I need to remind you, we are to be gospel people who impact the culture and others for their flourishing all the time, regardless of election results. Regardless of the election results, you can still love your neighbor. Regardless of election results, you can still share the gospel. Regardless of election results, we as a church can still care for the unborn. Regardless of election results, we as a church can still care for the born. Regardless of election results, some of you are still going to show up and minister to the gospel to men who are addicted to drugs, right? Regardless of whatever comes out in any election, we're going to be people who show up and minister the gospel to those who are suffering because we are gospel people and our allegiance is to King Jesus. We do not base our hope on an election. Regardless. And I just want you to know, that you and I both know that as we head into another long run-up to the presidential election, there's going to be things that each day is going to ramp it up, right? Ramp it up. And I want to tell you, don't ramp up with it. If you find yourself just ramping up as you get closer and closer, you're all stirred up, you just, it's all you want to talk about, turn your TV off. Don't ramp up with it. We are absolute monarchists. 
Pastor Tony Evans says, God doesn't ride on the back of elephants or donkeys. He doesn't come to take sides. He comes to take over. Jesus Christ is the one and true King and He is where your loyalty should lie. And we, may we be at the core of our hearts absolute monarchists who give our ultimate allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I'm so glad that you are in control and that you are sovereign and you know what you're doing because sometimes, at, when it, especially politically, things can get confusing, things can get crazy, things can get out of hand. Sometimes words can be thrown around. Sometimes in certain countries, riots can be happening. In other countries, bloodshed can be happening. And we don't understand it all. We don't understand why some come to power and others don't. But Lord, Keep our hope and our allegiance to you. Let us never forget that you are our sovereign reigning king. And one day, you're going to come back and establish your kingdom on this earth. And may we, as gospel people, submit to your authority now in all areas of our life for your praise and your fame. In Jesus' name, amen.